Dragon's Dogma 2 has limited fast travel, there are no horses or otherwise faster means of transportation, and in an almost backwards way, that makes it one of the best open worlds I've ever seen. But it isn't just the open world. While it does lead to some of the highest points in the game, the combat, customization, and general gameplay all stand next to some of the greatest in the industry. If Dragon's Dogma 2 is for you, it will be your game of the year. This game does certain things so well that I sincerely believe there will not be another one this year that accomplishes what it's able to. Now that's not to say this is automatically the best game this year, I mean it's only March after all and it's not like the game is perfect, it's got its flaws and things that will turn certain people away. However, if this is for you, you are going to struggle to find anything else this year, or any year for that matter, quite like Dragon's Dogma 2. Alright, let's get the disclaimers out of the way. I won't show any footage of areas outside of the first 10 hours of the game. There will be some boss spoilers, but these will be limited to early game bosses, and I'll only show two or three of them. I won't be discussing the story at all for two reasons. One, I don't want to spoil anything, and two, I haven't finished the story and it feels a bit unfair to review a story that I haven't seen the entirety of. Final disclaimer, I played this game on PS5 and it ran well for me, but I'm also not very perceptive of frame rates or graphical stuff since I grew up playing games that looked like this. Okay, with all that out of the way, let's talk talk about the video game. So this is what we have to figure out. Let's start with this first one. The amount of customization in this game borders on overwhelming, but it's done in such a way that it never truly reaches that level. And that's because you, the player, determine the depth. Let's start where the game does, the character creation screen. This is the best character creator I've ever seen. I very rarely outright say, this is the best blank ever, but this time, I'm pretty confident that I've never seen a character creator this good. It normally takes me well over an hour to create a character that looks even remotely like me, but in this game, it took less than 30 minutes. Not only is it quick, but it's also accurate. Just go to the subreddit for this game and you'll see dozens of characters that are nearly one-to-one -one with their real-life counterparts. So how is this creator able to have this level of detail while also being extremely efficient? Well, I think it comes down to this thing right here. See, this guy in the middle is your current character, with eight options surrounding them that will take you in eight different directions for what you want them to look like. You choose one, that one goes in the middle, and you get eight more. You then repeat this process a few times, and within a minute or two, you've already got a character that it's pretty close to what you're looking for. It's after this that you're thrown into a more traditional character creator where you can fine tune the details and create the god of war Kratos or the dragon of Dojima, Kiryu Kazuma. Now customization is hardly just limited to what your character looks like, it goes far deeper than that. There are 10 different vocations in this game, four of which are unlocked from the start and the rest you unlock as you play through. These vocations are effectively just classes from other games, they change your weapon, armor, skills, and of course, your fighting style. But these aren't just minor changes, they're pretty dramatic. You could build an entire game around any one of these vocations. Obviously, a mage is going to be different from a fighter, but what I really love about Dragon's Dogma is not just the variance between these classes, but the level of customization within them. I started the game as a fighter, but I wanted to play aggressively, so I used skills like Skyward Slash to reach higher weak points on enemies, Round Slash to deal with crowds, and Blitz Strike to close the distance. However, if you wanted to play as a tank fighter instead, you could use skills like Shield Drum to draw an enemy aggro, along with Vengeful Slash to counter, or Perfect Defense to turn yourself into an impenetrable fortress. If you're a mage on the other hand, you could play more support heavy with skills like Fire Boon to enhance the weapons of your allies, or Levin and Flagration if you want to play more offensively. And yet still, there's even more depth to this as there are plenty of skills that don't just focus on offense and defense. The fighter's launch board sends an ally flying into the air allowing them to access higher points on monsters with ease. I really could keep going for hours with this, but instead, just think about it this way. Everything I've just outlined is only one-fifth of the classes in this game, because remember, there are 10 of them. Okay, now here's what I want you to do. Take everything I just said, lower the class number by 4, and now you've got the pawn system. The exact same level of customization, but with an entire party. These party compositions are extremely important too, as you can't just use one method to defeat every single enemy in the game. Look at this slime for example. This thing is completely immune to physical attacks, so I couldn't hit it, unlike the subscribe button which you can hit at any time. As a result, I didn't have a way to harm it, and I was forced to run. However, this was my fault since my team was constructed poorly. If I had an off offensive mage or a sorcerer, I could have used offensive magic like ice or lightning to damage it or make it vulnerable to physical attacks by enchanting my weapons. These things are a serious threat if you haven't built your team correctly, but when I ran into one after switching to the mage class and with a second mage in my party, it was a total pushover. On top of all of this, the pawns you hire can gain experience by traveling with other players, which allows them to tell you about hidden treasures or guide you on quests. I'll end with this. The level of customization in this game is so unbelievably vast that within the first six hours, I already began to have thoughts about what my second playthrough would look like.
So if you like customization, Dragon's Dogma 2 is for you. Let's look at that second point. The best word to describe the combat of Dragon's Dogma is dynamic. You've likely seen this in the trailers already, and while trailers of games often show off the best parts in a slightly exaggerated way, that isn't the case here. This really is how the game plays. Here, let me give you an example. This is a troll. Huh? It's a simple boss that likes to leave the occasional comment getting upset about something that I never said. That joke is like 10 years old. I'm sorry, that was, that was dumb. Anyway, the troll is surprisingly acrobatic for its size. It's quick, it can run faster than you, and it can even jump and climb walls. I noticed this the first time I fought it and constructed a plan for the next time I ran into one. The second time I fought a troll, I pretty quickly jumped on its back. See, in Dragon's Dogma, you can grab smaller enemies and climb larger ones. When climbing, you can reach certain weak points, like the head, but more importantly, in this case, climbing allowed me to keep up the pressure even if it decided to run or jump onto a wall. Unfortunately for this troll, jumping is exactly what it did, and in that moment I stabbed it in the head and sent it tumbling down off the wall where my pawns and I promptly stomped it out. This is the type of thing that would usually be reserved for a cutscene or a quick time event, but in Dragon's Dogma, this is just the normal gameplay. You can use the environment to your advantage as well. There was one boss that I fought in a cave. This boss was fond of flying fairly frequently, so I quickly climbed a close by crag to catch the soaring sorcerer with a swift slash of my sword. There are plenty of examples of this, but I think it'd be best if you saw them for yourself, rather than having me explain them to you. The wonderful part about the combat in Dragon's Dogma is that it's just as customizable as the rest of the experience. How you choose to approach it is entirely up to you. There are multiple ways to defeat the enemies that stand in front of you, and I think figuring out your own way to do so is part of what makes the combat in this game so unique and special. But it's not perfect, and for a few reasons, this game isn't going to be for everyone. Let's start with the mechanics. First, there's inventory management. I think this is done really well here, but it's something to consider. Food and other perishable materials that you can find in the world will rot if left for too long. You can combine them to make potions of varying effects, cook them for temporary stat increases, or just eat them raw for health. You've got a lantern that you occasionally have to refill with lantern oil, otherwise it'll go dark and it'll be impossible to see in caves or at night. Along with this, there's a weight system. You can only carry so much before you start to run slower or become over encumbered. The limited fast travel is going to be a big deal for some people too. While you can travel between settlements via ox cart and you can use the rare fairy stones to warp you to port crystals, which are also few and far between, scarcity is the name of the game here. Your fast travel options are limited. On top of all of this, there's just this general clunkiness to this game at points. Your AI companions can be extremely capable, but they can also throw themselves off of cliffs. The command to ask a pawn for help doesn't really have a way to specify which pawn you want to help you, meaning if one pawn goes, hey, there's a chest over here, you want to see it, and you go, sure, then another pawn might insert themselves into the conversation and start leading you to a quest that you never asked about. Worst of all is that occasionally, even if you make it in time, you can miss a high five. To me, however, none of that matters in the face of the most important part of Dragon's Dogma 2. Here, let me hit you with a quote from the game's director, Hideaki Itsuno. Our goal was to prepare a path so enjoyable that players wouldn't feel the need for a horse. Our development policy was to make it so that it would actually be a shame to ride a horse. The reason for the limited fast travel and the total lack of horses is because this game is so unreasonably dense that using a horse wouldn't work and using fast travel would be a waste. Instead of more traditional open worlds with massive plains and endless expanses that stretch on forever, Dragon's Dogma feels far more claustrophobic, and that's for good reason. There doesn't exist a moment in Dragon's Dogma where you get bored running from one settlement to the next, because 30 seconds after you start your journey, you hear some rumbling, look to the right, and see a massive cyclops crashing through the trees. You'll notice a statue that pulls your attention away from the main road and into the more dense foliage where you'll stumble across a chest, and then a goblin settlement, and then a cave and an empty house, and then you'll sleep at the empty house and you'll get ambushed in the middle of the night by bandits who saw your campfire. You'll climb a cliff face and a massive griffin will land in front of you, forcing you to flee into a nearby cave, and when I say this is all barely, barely scratching the surface of what happens in this game, I really do mean it, because a massive part of what makes this game so special are those moments of shock and awe when you discover something hiding around the corner. So naturally, I want to avoid saying too much so that you can experience these moments for yourself. Where most open world games are as wide as an ocean and deep as a puddle, Dragon's Dogma 2 is as wide as a river and deep as an ocean, if that river also had dozens of other connecting rivers branching off that all led into their own personal oceans. What really makes Dragon's Dogma 2 special 
special, what makes it this one-of-a-kind game is that the focus isn't on size. Itsuno and the team at Capcom don't care how big the world is, they care about the stories you can tell within it. This game has its clunky moments here and there, but far more frequently you'll see something unbelievable or do something so incredible that for just a moment you'll think, this might be the best game I've ever played. The most magnificent thing about this game is that when you start it and see how far you have to go to reach the next city or town, you'll wish you could just sprint over there on a horse or teleport with some magic. But by the time you get there, by the time this one journey of many has concluded, all you'll be able to think about is how glad you are that you couldn't.